Hey everybody and welcome to this week's fishery. I hope you had a great weekend and I hope you're doing well this week. So today we are on episode 110 of fishery and we have four great episodes coming at you this week. So thank you so much for your support. Thanks for watching on the Aquatic Morning Show or for being a member of the channel. Only $1.99 you get four extra episodes each week on all the new and exciting stuff going on in the world of fishery, academic information, and uh, any news in the fish world and hobby. So I wanted to say congratulations to my friend Ivan Mikolji, co-founder of our nonprofit, the Green Earth Alliance. He has actually had a fish named after him, and you can now meet this fish, the Astronautis Mikolgii, from the Rio Orinoco, and it is a newly described wild Venezuelan and Colombian species of Orinoco Oscar. And it was collected in a stream off the Orinoco and has a highly ornate juvenile pattern when it's young and then later develops rows of vivid red spots along its lower flanks. So if you're interested in checking this cichlid out or getting one, you can uh, you can visit uh, www.tangledupincichlids.com and they've got more information on care and where you can buy it even in the US now. It's already here for you. So, episode 110, new fossils highlight how fish evolved from the oceans, then to walk on land, then they turned around, and then some changed their minds, went back into the oceans, and then some came back, and then turned into tetrapods like us, four arms and legs, or two arms, two legs, you get it. Uh, and some then, like whales, decided to go right back into the ocean. So a green eel-like creature crawling out of the water about 375 million years ago, about the same time that scientists say fish developed physical characteristics that allowed them to get up on land, kind of like uh, mud skippers and things, they started getting fins that grew appendages that they could stand on. So now a new study in the Journal of Nature suggests that the relative of the now famous uh, first creature to go from fish to on land, its name is Tiktaalik, and or Tiktaalik, uh, there's a new uh, cousin that they have discovered named Quicky Quictania. I'm gonna mess that up. So <laughs> you had this evolutionary series of events where fish evolve to walk, and then all of a sudden they decide, mm, nah, I'm going back in the water. And then later they come back out in some cases, and other cousins of that lineage decide, no, nah, I'm going to stay in the water, like the coelacanth. So these are pretty interesting fossil finds. They were actually found at the same time as the uh, Tiktaalik, uh, specimen, and at the University of Chicago, paleontologist Neil Shubin uh, co-authored a recent study and was part of a team that discovered that original Tiktaalik during the 2004 expedition in the Canadian Arctic. So, Quicky Quictania <laughs> was found on the same trip, but the fossil kind of went unstudied and put away into storage while they focused on the other one. Now that they're looking at this new species, uh, they realize it's a very close cousin of the Tiktaalik, and it is known with all the same features, except for instead of evolving more legs and bendable joints to stand up in shallow water and walk through the marshes and on land, it actually grew uh, more like fin structures again after it had already grown the ones on land because remember its cousin there was the fossil from before so early tetrapods likely spent most of their time in and out of water kind of around the edge of the water and so there are real specific bones and joint arrangements that allowed animals to prop themselves up just like us standing on two feet, fish standing on two or four limbs is a big deal. So now Tom Stewart, an evolutionary biologist at Penn State, also worked on this study and said that Quicky Quictania's physiology suggests it was swimming 
uh, in open water, similar evolutionary modifications to quick, quicky quick Tanya's fins are the result of its swimming ancestors previously crawling onto land, then returning to the water, which is really unexpected. It's not something any of them expected. Usually you think of the, the progress of evolution of, you know, an ape walking, slowly getting taller and walking onward, or a fish crawling out of a puddle and turning into something more complex. But this is a counterexample, and it is debunking the linear myth of evolution. It just doesn't work that way. So some species go back, some go forward, and there's not really a forward or back as it is thought of in our lives, it's really what allows the animal to survive. So the transition from life in water to life on land and going both ways, it stalls, does a few laps, branches off, splits apart into some cousins, they do some circles, they evolve again, and then some of them become permanent land dwellers, some of them hang out in the waters like crocodiles and things, and others that go on to land actually re-evolve to be cetaceans, which are whales and uh, uh, porpoises and dolphins. Pretty crazy stuff, but just another interesting fact about how our fishy friends, or at least the relatives of them, our, our uh, shared ancestry, uh, contributed to us getting up onto land and not, and then back onto land, and then back into the water, and all sorts of crazy things. Who knows what we'll find next? Thanks for joining me. I'll see you guys next time on Fishery. Hey everybody, how's it going? So we got a bummer episode today for you. Episode 111, No Limits, with more devastating news coming out daily about the state of water in the southwestern United States. There is yet another sign of the times. From the Rio Grande running dry in Albuquerque last week to aquifers running dry and then forming sinkholes all throughout the Central Plains and Texas, uh, Oklahoma, the hits just keep coming. Now the managers of the Queens and Jumbo Reservoirs have pulled all the rules on fish. You can take as many fish as you can get your hands on. You can have 20 poles, whatever you want. Colorado Parks and Wildlife, CPW, authorized the hauls for Queens Reservoir beginning in July 21st and Jumbo, July 25th, that those two bodies of water are in critical danger of drying up and they're going to kill all the fish that live there anyways. So they told fishermen and women around the state, come and get it while you can. Due to declining water levels and increasing temperatures as the summer progresses, the reservoirs are in imminent danger of suffering a catastrophic fish kill-off. So Mitch Martin, acting CPW regional manager, said that they haven't ever seen anything like this uh, in over 120 years of different uh, groups managing this. But basically, it's, it's uh, different rivers and parts of the Colorado River um, that are in combination with drought and high temperatures. They're having to be used to divert water as a last resort to dams that create electricity downstream and to farmlands. Uh, it's part of the Arkansas River and the Great Plains Reservoir, these two reservoirs where you can catch whatever you want, crappie, uh, catfish, bass, walleye, sturgeon, uh, all sorts of little uh, trout and uh, walleye, um, sag eye apparently too, uh, and possession limits have been lifted. There are uh, you can fish with a fly, uh, a lure, no restrictions on the bag limit, and uh, all you need is a fishing license. So if you're in the area, go get those fish, move them if you want, eat them if you want. It's just a tragic scene playing out across the country as now we have to decide between agriculture that was, uh, do we want to feed that or do we want to feed the lakes and rivers where these animals live? And oftentimes this infrastructure was built for that hundred year drought and if uh, nothing changes we seem to have been in a 500 year drought according to what they built these systems for so as time goes on they're expecting many of the taps to run dry from these reservoirs they're also expecting the soil will crack loosen sandstorms dust devils 
and even haboobs, one of my favorite word in the, well, it's probably not English, but it, you know, it's Arabic, means sandstorm, massive sandstorm, uh, will happen just like during the Dust Bowl if something doesn't change. Uh, the plants are even dying that hold the ground together and the rivers together and there's silt in the rivers that's choking out the fish even if there is water. And even worse than that, there's not enough water to run the turbines in some of the dams. So if you've seen news about Lake Mead, Lake Powell, they may have the rest of the season, could be a number of months. They might make it through to the rain if the rain does come, but we don't know if it will. So pretty uh, devastating and serious news that uh, we've never seen in American history. And it's something to think about, especially if uh, you don't live in those areas and you don't think it's like the, in the forefront of your mind. Uh, it's something that we're one country. We're going to have to help those people. Those people are going to have to go somewhere. And without electricity, especially, I mean, or with rolling blackouts, if it's 120 degrees in Phoenix or something like that, you need your AC. That's life support at that point. And we only were able to move out into these areas like Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, uh, parts of Texas and so forth because of air conditioning, because of irrigation. And when we don't have that anymore, it can't support the people that we have out there. And that's just the uh, scary truth. So uh, whatever you want to blame as the cause, I'm going to call it like it is and say global climate change clearly. It's changed to something. Um, we need to do something about it and, and plan ahead. So kind of a bummer news, uh, kind of crazy news, just sign after sign after sign if you look through the news of local places running out of water, saying you can't use water during certain times of day, saying that a dam or you know hydroelectric plant, which is what a dam really is, uh, is going to be out of water, reservoirs, no boat launches, I mean, stories after stories, bodies being found in reservoirs, it is just bad news all around. Well, unless you were missing one of those mobsters that turned up in an oil drum. Alright guys, well, I'll see you next time on Fish Street. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you later. Back to you, Jess. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 112, yeah, of Fishery. Fresh water, sir? Yes, please, Saurus. Plesiosaur? 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 Oh, okay, the Plesiosaur is this big giant dinosaur found in 1823 by a fossil hunter, Mary Anning. And uh, they were prehistoric reptiles with small heads, super long necks, and four flippers. They are what uh, reconstructed uh, images of the Loch Ness Monster are supposed to look like. Uh, you may have had toys as a kid of them with the long neck and the big body and yeah. So these are uh, not actually, uh, they're, they're not actually dinosaurs, but what they are uh, in many cases is a reptile related to them that took to the water. They're, they're kind of a proto or side by side with some of the early fish uh, lineage of, of creatures. And some of them, uh, they think now, may not have only been in marine water, which I think is super interesting. So scientists from the University of Bath and the University of Portsmouth uh, in the UK uh, as well as the Université Hassan II of Morocco, uh, have reported that a small plesiosaur from the Cretaceous Age was found in a dried uh, historic riverbed that's in modern-day Africa. And the fossils include bones, teeth, and a three-meter-long adult arm section and bone uh, that's about uh, about nine feet and then there's a baby section 1.5 meters four and a half feet and they're finding them in fresh water locations the other fossils in these locations are frogs crocodiles turtles and fish that have been shown to be inland seas or inland lakes and rivers um, specific species so another huge aquatic dinosaur the Spinosaurus, which is an actual dinosaur, uh, the fossils on it suggest that it was able to tolerate fresh water and adapt to spending its life 
there and uh, eating a lot of fish. Now, because of this, their teeth were all banged up. By the time they see their, their uh, fossilized body or they find chunks of teeth, they're shattered from chewing on things that look like the coelacanth or these big bony armored freshwater fish that were around at the time. And according to a, uh, a Dr. Nick Longrich, uh, who is the corresponding and publicity author of this uh, paper and study. He said the bones and teeth were found scattered in all different localities in the search area, not as one skeleton. So each bone and tooth is from a different animal. And it looks like they've already uncovered over a dozen animals in this collection. So while bones provide information on where an animal died, the teeth are kind of more interesting in some ways because they get lost while the animal was alive and it shows where the animal lived which in this case happened to be in solidly fresh water places so what's more the teeth show heavy wear just like the spinosaurus dinosaur and it's found alongside bodies of the spinosaurus and they are believed to have been a largely landlocked population in this location and they were found in wetlands, freshwater, brackish water, and estuaries. But in this case, in the Sahara, they're totally landlocked. And at the time, it would have been something akin to a freshwater sea, maybe Lake Victoria or the Great Lakes. And uh, it's still a bit controversial, but who's to say that uh, because paleontologists have always called them marine reptiles when looking at these things, that they had to live in the sea? So lots of marine lineages have invaded fresh water over time. Think of salmon, freshwater, dolphins even, mammals, that evolved at least four different times. Dolphins evolved in the Ganges River, the Yangtze River, twice in the Amazon. You got the pink ones and the other ones. And also there's a freshwater seal that is in Lake Baikal in the middle of Siberia, in the middle of Russia, which is bizarre. So the plesiosaurs belong to the family uh, Leptoclidaeidae, uh, a family of plesiosaurs is often found in brackish water elsewhere, but in England and Africa, as well as Australia, there are these smaller plesiosaurs, uh, including Elamiosaurus, that turn up in brackish water. Also in China, there's another very similar dinosaur that is yet to be named, or I should stop saying dinosaur, it's just hard not to. They're very similar and it's recent that they were split up. But uh, it says that this group was around in all these different places for over a hundred million years. So this was a very successful lineage of creatures. And what scientists have found elsewhere and what the authors of this paper are suggesting is that the fact that they're in these either freshwater or brackish water estuarine uh, regions in the other locations shows that they could have slowly moved into totally fresh water and then they could have gotten landlocked in modern day Morocco in the Sahara. So uh, pretty interesting stuff. The paper's called uh, Non-Marine uh, View of Plesiosaurus During the Cre Cre <laughs> Cretaceous Age Research Project. And uh, if you want to read more about it, I've, of course, got links to it uh, on my members page in the community tab on YouTube. Thanks again for listening, guys. I know we had two prehistoric stories uh, today, and I also want to thank all you guys who send in stories, who share ideas, or, you know, there's a lot of, like, record this fish or record that fish size caught somewhere. And I have to, like, wade through these and decide which ones to talk about, and I... Uh, it's a hard task. Oftentimes, there's so much news to cover. Uh, I kind of file it away, and hopefully we'll get to it another time. But as this is trying to be an audio format, uh, for those of you who like to listen to this uh, podcast style, um, I'm trying to keep the pictures to a minimum unless you want to check in online. But thanks for coming by. It was great to see you, and I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, back to you, Jess. Have a good one, guys. And uh, hey, everybody in chat on the Aquatic Morning Show. Hope you're having a great morning with tasty coffee or Dr. Pepper or whatever you drink. Bye. Hey, guys. Welcome to the end of the week. You've made it to episode 
113 of Fishery with the secret history living in your aquarium on the Aquatic Morning Show with me, Alexander Williamson. And as you can see, there is daylight at the end of the week. It's some sort of metaphor. Uh, go with it. Anyways, today we have an episode that's kind of interesting, and it's because of a viewer who sent me a link. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen it at all. A lot of times people see it, send me links, and I see this stuff, or I've come across it, and things like that. Uh, but, which I love, so please keep sending the links. Uh, very appreciative. Uh, it makes my job easier, and it's just fascinating, so thank you. Uh, but, then we also sometimes have uh, things sent where, you know, I just, my, my eyes were not open to it, or at least I didn't see it until uh, someone brought it up. And then I started, you know, looking around at other articles, and this is one of those cases. So thank you so very much. Uh, any case, when it comes to the reproduction of uh, a particular type of red algae, it gets by with a little help from its friends. Uh, small crustaceans that transport sex cells between male and female algae cells uh, like pollen-laden bees buzzing from flower to flower in the garden. The discovery in uh, the first known example of animal-driven pollination in algae, uh, researchers just made a uh, announcement about, which I, I think is really, really cool. Uh, they said that the this is the first known case of animals pollinating algae uh, anywhere on land or in the sea or wherever you want to look but both the red algae and the the crustaceans uh belong to a group that's older than land-based plants so it also shows us that this is something that could have been around before land-based plants so this could be evolutionarily the start of how land-based plants teamed up with insects to reproduce and to pollinate, which is awesome. It's fascinating. A lot of people don't realize that actual flowers on plants is a fairly new adaptation. Before that, there were spore-producing uh, plants and lichens and mosses and things like that, but the idea of uh, flowers for other animals to use and to then hop from one place to another or the wind to uh, help with that is a evolutionary uh, well blink of an eye really in the sense of how long life has been on earth it's only around 56 million years old apparently uh, that plants work that out, which is really incredible. Uh, if you think of every, you know, image of the dinosaurs you have and the fact that they all died 64 million years ago. So imagine every, uh, is landscape that you could imagine with dinosaurs, not full of strange exotic plants with crazy flowers, but, uh, no flowers. There are probably strange exotic plants, but no flowers. Uh, so that thought alone is really interesting, but scientists were kind of dumbfounded when they noticed that there was this red algae that was being pollinated by, uh, not, I mean, and also not by an insect, but by a micro crustacean, a little tiny, uh, it's related to, uh, what we would call like a pill bug or a potato bug, sow bug, depends on the part of the country you live in, but it is a microscopic version of that, a little teeny one. And they basically, they, they had, uh, tanks and they did a study where they set it up so that there were tanks of water, uh, aquariums, and there was, uh, dye running through so that you could see that there was uh, no disturbance of the water. So some sort of pigment was applied to uh, the center. And that way they knew there was no water flow going between the uh, two 
types of algae or the two uh, blooms of algae. And in the tanks where they just let it be for a week, nothing happened. I mean, the, the algae just hung out, did its thing. It flowered, but it nothing happened. It didn't pollinate and then go to seed. It didn't germinate and get fertilized. Whereas uh, in the other tanks where then they applied a little bit of flow, they found that, yeah, a few of the pieces of algae uh, managed to connect and talk to the other algae. So a few, a few sperm and eggs uh, matched up just like pollen granules do because of the wind. But in the tank that had the little uh, aquatic pill bug things, uh, they had 20 times the success with fertilization as in the tanks without. And then they checked like if it was a male versus female thing with the little bugs or if they needed both genders. And it, it just turned out it, that their daily life is going between different uh, groups of this stuff and foraging for uh, something about it. So uh, really interesting development. And uh, it means that this could be what then evolved uh, into plants being pollinated by bees. So then you might have had beetles going from one uh, slimy algae pile and back in 40 million years ago or 60 million years ago and uh, then another and then you had uh, a beetle walking across the land touching the slimy algae and then going to another of the same type and mixing together their uh, flowering or their their sex cells their male and female sex cells so this is the whole also the differentiation of male versus female in plants or algae which is pre-plants even so really interesting stuff and now they're wondering you know are there cyanobacterias that are this way um are there other animals or other bugs or other crustaceans out there that are doing this same job with algae because they didn't really think to check there as a you know it was that wasn't where they were looking it just so happened that that was a discovery they found so i think that's pretty cool news and uh we'll learn more about it soon of course and uh it's just a reminder to keep your eyes open for discoveries and wonder and really interesting connections when uh, you're not expecting them because you know this world it connects in so many different ways when you when you're passionate about things and you learn things even if it's something trivial like fishery then you learn th something one day and then a month later you learn something else and then you go out into your daily life and somehow it clicks that this connects with that because this mechanism is the same and uh you never know when that information is going to change the world or at least make your life easier or be interesting. And that's the idea of fish trees. So thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend and uh, I appreciate the like and subscribe on the main channel if uh, you're watching the Aquatic Morning Show. And uh, if you're already here, then I mean, I can't thank you anymore. You're already a member uh, and you're getting this early. So thank you so very much, uh, everybody. All right, have a great weekend all, and I will talk to you later. Back to you, Jess. Bye.